Uh, my name's Rihanna. I'm one of the PGD genetic counsellors at Guy's Hospital. If somebody has a BRCA mutation or a mutation that leads to Lynch syndrome, um, that's inherited in what's called an autosomal dominant uh, fashion. So that means that there's a 50% chance or a one in two chance of that individual passing it on to the future generation. There are a number of options for that individual or couple. Um, so, of course, they have the option to do absolutely nothing, carry on as they would naturally, um, opt for natural conceptions uh, or IVF if that's what they would like to do or need to do. Um, and the knowledge would be there that the risk of any child they have would have a 50% chance of having the mutation and therefore the risks associated in relation to developing cancer. Um, another option is what we call prenatal testing. So again, this is having a pregnancy naturally or through IVF um, and then actually testing that pregnancy uh, for the familial mutation. So for the BRCA, for the Lynch mutation. Um, often people would opt to, cho to choose this pathway because they would then intervene in the pregnancy if the pregnancy was affected. Um, and so what I mean by that really is choose to end a pregnancy that was affected by one of these mutations. So that is an option and it's a very personal choice, but it is available for people if that's their preferred route. Um, and then lastly, there is an option of course called PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. There is an option of course called PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. PGD is the term that we use at Guy's Hospital, um, but if you look up PGD, you may come across the term PGTM, uh, which is um, kind of a newer term um, to describe this um, pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, so we are talking about the same thing. It's just it, in different places, they call it slightly different things. And this uses IVF methods to actually um, create an embryo outside of the womb. That embryo is then genetically tested for the familial mutation. And only embryos without the mutation are used to generate a pregnancy. So only those embryos without the BRCA or Lynch mutation are put back into the womb. Um, it's really important to note that we're not genetically editing embryos. We're not taking genes out of embryos. We are just looking at them and putting the embryos back that are unaffected. So that inheritance that I mentioned, that 50-50 is the same, if, even if it's from a man or from a woman. So the options are available to people regardless of their gender or sex. If a female um, who's wanting to undergo PGD has had cancer, they may have had chemotherapy and that may impact their egg quality. But also if a man has had um, a, a cancer and he's had chemotherapy, especially in the sort of groin region, that may impact his sperm quality as well. So it, it's a consideration for both men and women, just depending on the treatment that they've had. When we talk about PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, we're talking about an IVF-like procedure that's available to um, individuals and families and couples who have um, high-risk genetic mutations, so um, high-risk gene genetic causes of um, predisposition to cancer, basically. So there are moderate risk causes out there, um, but currently those moderate risk causes wouldn't be eligible for PGD. England has its own agreement, Scotland has its own agreement, Wales and so does Northern Ireland, but generally they all fund um, couples in the same situation. To be eligible for the NHS funding, currently the couple or individual would have to not have any unaffected uh, or healthy children. You would both need to be non-smokers. Um, the female partner's BMI would need to be between 19 and 30. There would need to be at least a 10% risk um, to a child of having a sort of a serious um, condition. So cancer would constitute a serious condition. Um, you need to be referred by clinical genetics. So we can't accept GP referrals or referrals from oncologists. Um, and again, the female partner would have to be under the age of 40 at the point of starting treatment. Um, we would also need an HFEA license for any condition that we do PGD for, but BRCA and Lynch have those licenses in place already. So that wouldn't be something the couple would have to be concerned about. So generally they can have up to three cycles of PGD and a cycle is thought about when a woman is stimulated. Um, so every time a woman undergoes stimulation, um, that is a cycle, however that cycle um, ends. 
the NHS, like I said, funds up to three cycles, but if a couple or an individual um, falls out of the NHS funded criteria whilst they're going through treatment. So, um, for example, if the female partner turns over 40 or um, one or the other of them becomes smokers or they have a child together that's well, sort of naturally whilst they're having PGD, then they wouldn't be eligible for NHS funding any longer. So they wouldn't be able to continue with NHS funded PGD. Um, and there are some uh, cases as well where um, the um, individual becomes quite unwell um, because, you know, generally sometimes related to the genetic condition in the family or in the individual. And if it's not safe to continue treatment, we will stop treatment um, at that point. Um, and lastly, if the chance of success is thought to be very, very low, so they've done one or two cycles and the outcome has always been um, quite poor, it, they're unlikely to offer a third cycle if it's likely to be the same result. So there can be some times where the full three cycles aren't used. So there are a few options for people who um, don't fit the NHS criteria. So at Guys, which is where I work, we have a self-funded option um, as well as a private option, and they do differ slightly. So what self-funded means is it's people that are eligible for NHS care in general, um, but they're not eligible for PGD. So on the NHS, so they might already have a healthy child, for example, or they might be um, slightly over the age of 40. Um, and that costs around £12,000 for the full cycle. There is a private function which is more consultant-led care, so that's private in the way that you may think of private care in general, so quicker timescales, um, you choose your own consultant, um, much more personalised package, um, and that can be sort of £14,000-£15,000 per cycle, and is open to people who are outside of the NHS, so open to people who are abroad. Um, but obviously there are other centres in the UK as well, so um, the HFEA website is a good place to look at to review all of the centres that are licensed to offer PGD across the UK. The main difference is going to be in relation to price really. So the NHS will fund the actual PGD process for um, people in same-sex couples, whether they're same-sex female couples or same-sex male couples. Um, but the actual gamete part, so the gamete donations, whether that be sperm donation for same-sex female couples or um, egg donation for, and surrogacy for same-sex male couples, that part isn't funded. So that will be a cost that would have to be self-funded by the couple. Um, and that can be quite expensive, especially if you're thinking about egg donation and surrogacy as well. So for a same-sex female couple or a couple that needs sperm donation, because we do have um, couples where the male is unable to produce sperm, um, the sperm donor, uh, the sperm bank situation would need to be paid for by the couple. And that can be around 1,500 to 1,700, 2,000 pounds. It just depends on the sperm bank that's used. We do have a list of sperm banks that um, also provide DNA samples, which is what we need uh, for PGD. So that is um, something we can help the couple choose. For same-sex male couples or couples that would need to use a surrogate, so if the female partner is unable to carry a child for health reasons, um, the egg donation um, for the same-sex male couples with the surrogacy would then be around five to 10,000 pounds. So it can be very expensive. Um, but there are charities out there that help, so Surrogacy UK, for example, that can help um, access surrogates um, and talk about egg donors as well. So again, I can only speak for how uh, what our waiting times are at Guy's Hospital. So from the point we see, receive a referral from the clinical genetics team um, that our patient that the patient is with or under, uh, we normally see that. Uh, individual or couple within around six to eight weeks. So it's not a huge time to actually see one of the PGD genetics team. Um, in terms of actually starting treatment, that can differ quite a lot on the individual um, or couple's kind of personal medical experience. If we need to get any additional information before we can put them forward for treatment. But generally, um, if the couple are keen to go ahead straight away, it would be around three or four months um, to actually see the fertility team and start all the basic fertility investigations and tests. Um, and then the actual treatment itself, the genetic testing of the embryos, the putting back of the embryos um, to actually generate a pregnancy, all of that together, you're probably looking at around sort of eight months or so, um, all being well. 
And then after that, of course, it's nine months uh, for pregnancy. So that's kind of very vague timings, but they do differ a lot between individuals and couples because they will have their own um, specific needs. Um, and of course, we're working within the NHS, so timings can change depending on what the NHS is dealing with at that point. So that's a question we get asked all the time. So basically, with um, when someone starts PGD, their chance of having a healthy child at the end of that, um, a pregnancy at the end of that is one in three. Um, as they move through the process, so if we get to a point where they have embryos and the embryos have had the genetic testing and there are embryos that are what we call suitable for transfer, so embryos that don't have the familial mutation, once that embryo is put back, it goes up to 50-50, so one in two. And that's because by that point, they've kind of gone over quite a few of the hurdles. So they've had stimulation and that's worked. The embryos have fertilized successfully and grown and tested. So they're the, the kind of sticking points where cycles may fail. And that's why the success rate is lower at, right at the beginning versus as you sort of make your way through. In terms of sort of IVF, the success rates will be higher for IVF um, because they're not screening out embryos. So they can use every single embryo that's created, whereas we are very likely to have to discard some of the embryos because, of course, we're doing it to prevent having a child with the familial mutation. Um, that's a very sort of overall success rate and it uses statistics from all of our cycles. So we treat women who are in their early 20s all the way up to their 40s who have very different fertility histories. Um, so if somebody's had many years of um, infertility and then they're coming through for PGD and they have a low ovarian reserve or things like that, that might impact that success rate and make it slightly lower um, versus a very young um, couple who've had no problems with fertility, their success rate may be slightly higher. If you have um, one or two or three rounds and they're all unsuccessful, um, you have the option to then pay for further treatment. So using that self-funded pathway or private pathway. Um, but we would be very sort of frank in discussions with you about the chance of success, because what we don't want you to do is to spend £12,000, £15,000 when there is a very small chance of success. Um, because really, it's not worth it for you um, as a patient or an individual to go through that um, and spend the money. So we would be um, quite careful as to who we accept for the self-funded care in those situations if they've already had a number of cycles. So this is a question that we often get um, and we don't recommend and um, we don't sort of um, suggest testing of a child for an adult onset condition. So BRCA and Lynch are adult onset conditions, so cancer risks don't start to increase until, um, well in Lynch, you know, in the 20s, BRCA the 30s. Um, so if there's a child under the age of 18, they would be classed as an unaffected child, um, even though they may not have had or would not have had genetic testing. Um, we definitely wouldn't be doing the testing for that child on the NHS and we would be really advising against doing testing for that child privately. Um, it goes against quite a lot of ethical um, processes really. That child is, should be able to make their own decision when they grow up. Um, talking to a child about a genetic condition is particularly difficult and if you've gone off and had them tested, how do you explain that to them as they're growing up? It's a lot of medicalization for a young, a young person. So although it can be quite frustrating, um, if you find out about BRCA or Lynch after you've already got a child, so it may make you ineligible for PGD, it really isn't something that we would be recommending that you do. So um, what we do within the PGD service is we are kind of the first uh, people that the couple or individual will see. We talk them through the, the entire PGD process and we're with them every step of the way so we can be a contact for them throughout the, the process. We're very much involved in the genetic side of things. So we will help with um, understanding the genetic testing and how that works because it's quite particular how we do the genetic testing. And we can also sometimes be involved in um, actually relaying the genetic results from the embryo testing and explaining those if they're complex um, but the rest of the the treatment is done by the fertility unit um, so we're involved in talking to the patients about how the process works and if questions come in from patients or families we can answer them as well If they have a cycle or two and they have a successful cycle, so they have a child or three cycles, they have a child and they want to have further treatment. Again, they have the self-funded option to start from the beginning. So that's, like I said, £12,000 or so. 
But if they have embryos left over that were classed as suitable for transfer, they can then pay to have those embryos put back in. So one embryo at a time. And that cost is £1,500, so £1,500. So that's a lot cheaper because it is just the transfer of the embryo. Um, and if, that, if they have embryos available, then great, then they'll be able to do that for subsequent children. So it's very much up to them. They may have a number of embryos and they don't wish to have further children. They then have the option to sort of put those embryos for research or for training, or they can just discard them as well. There is um, a little bit of evidence that there's a slight increase in borderline ovarian tumours um, in taking IVF medication. But it's actually, and there's very little actually known about the exact risk. Um, and there isn't specific research in the BRCA or Lynch population. Uh, when they've done research in the BRCA population about cancer in general um, after IVF, most studies showed no increase in cancer risk for um, BRCA patients over sort of one to three cycles. But as far as I'm aware, that research hasn't been done for Lynch patients. We're based in London at Guy's Hospital, but we do have satellite centres um, in Sheffield, Leeds and Exeter. So what that means is you can have a conversation with local genetic counsellors and attend fertility teams locally and only have to come to London for two or three appointments as part of the, the PGD process. So that's something that people who are living up north or sort of down south quite like because it means they don't have to travel to London as often. Um, and so, again, it would be up to your your local genetic cancer to refer to the right team to access that. So um, we completely recognise that PGD is quite a difficult process. Um, it can be described a little bit like a roller coaster, um, lots of ups and downs, and it's over a long period of time. So we do have um, avenues for support for couples and individuals. So we have fertility counsellors that work within the IVF unit, and they're kind of pros at talking about uh, the impact of IVF on an individual, on a relationship, um, sort of on the day to day. Um, but within the genetics unit, we also have psychologists and they're um, experts in talking about the impact of a genetic condition um, and thinking about ways to cope with worry, cope with stress and anxiety. Um, so there are avenues for support sort of in both of those. And there are obviously lots of charities that work with people um, who are having IVF. So there's avenues outside of the NHS as well, if that's a preferred um, route for some people. If PGD is something you're interested in, the first thing I would suggest is that you talk to your genetic counsellor, um, to your NHS genetic counsellor. Um, because they will know how to refer to PGD centres, including Guy's Hospital, um, and they will be aware of the NHS funding criteria and things like that as well. If you don't have a genetic counsellor, if it's been a very long time since you've seen one, the way to be referred into your local genetic service is through your GP. So it would be a matter of asking your GP to refer you to their local genetic service uh, for maybe a reproductive options discussion. So to discuss all the options that are available to you um, and then you can be referred on from there. Um, of course, if you want to look into private and self-funded options, you are also able to look on the HFEA website. Like I said, there's a list on the HFEA website of all um, IVF clinics that are licensed for PGD and that's a good place to start as well.